Well, today is a really exciting day for us. It marks the initiation of our 2024 Thought Leadership Series, brought to you by the library here at Wilston Sydney University. And we're honoured as a university to stand at the forefront, having achieved the prestigious position of being ranked number one in the world in the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings for both 2022 and 2023. We are waiting with bated breath for the 2024 results. These rankings are unique as they evaluate universities against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, aligning with our institution's commitment to sustainability and resilience as outlined in our Decadal Strategy 2030. This journey began in November 22 and November 2022 and today we gather for our 18th event in the Thought Leadership Series. Our first speaker for this series in 2024 is Dr. Michelle Ryan and she's speaking today on the topic of the impacts of urbanisation on the platypus in the Hawkesbury Nepean. And I have been assured there's not just pictures but also videos of very cute furry things. That's why I'm here. Dr Ryan is a Senior Lecturer in Ecology and Environmental Science and she brings a wealth of expertise to this topic. Michelle holds an undergraduate degree in Environmental Management and has been actively contributing to universities and industry since completing her PhD in 2014. Her dedication extends to roles such as working at Sydney Water within the Education and Engagement team. Michelle's focus areas encompass aquatic environments and environmental health. And at Western Sydney University, she's imparted knowledge through various subjects, including integrated science, urban environment, field project, environmental issues and solutions, and water quality assessment and management. So those are very important contributions to education here at Western. Michelle's passions, and we love people to have passions, extend to community engagement for positive environmental outcomes through education. Her research interests delve into human impacts on aquatic environments, with a specific emphasis on the ecological health of freshwater systems and aquatic vertebrates. Currently, her research is centred on populations of platypus in Greater Sydney. So I'd ask you to welcome Michelle. I would look forward very much to hearing about her research on this really exciting topic. So thank you very much. All right. Well, I don't need to introduce myself. So thank you so much. Um, I run the Hawkesbury Nepean Platypus Project. We've been going for a few years now, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about uh, our work in Western Sydney. Uh, before we start, we would like to acknowledge that we work on Wiradjuri and Darug nations, and we pay our respects to Aboriginal people, including elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you. Uh, I'm one person, but I'm actually a team. And presenting data here that we've collected as a group, we're a team of women uh, who are very passionate about waterway health. Uh, so I have my PhD student, Catherine Warwick, who is all about at the very pointy end of her PhD. Um, so I'll be presenting some of her data today. Uh, I have Madison White, who has just submitted her master's thesis. And we have Brianne Webb, who's online watching this, uh, who is just starting her PhD journey, but worked with us as an undergraduate did undergraduate project with us uh, and now we have taken her through and she's just started her PhD. So it's really exciting. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge the contribution that my team made to this work. So platypus is arguably the world's strangest creature. A bill like a duck, a tail kind of like a beaver, and they're a mammal who lays eggs. They're known as monotremes. They lay one to three eggs every two or so years in burrows on earthy banks up and down the east coast of Australia, Tasmania, and over on Kangaroo Island. The Puggles, uh, which they're a very cute name for them, uh, also known as hatchlings, uh, emerge from the burrows around now. So we start to see uh, small little platypus coming out of burrows and searching for their own territory. Now, this is one of those platypus. This is Tom, uh, and we name our platypus. And I'm sure a psychologist will tell me it's because I humanise them or something, but we really do it for two reasons. One, it's a lot easier for us when we're looking at our data or talking about a platypus to say, oh, 
uh, Jilla had this or Tom had this level or it's really easy for us to talk about. Uh, the second thing is we usually have landholders with us and landholders are the ones who we let name them um, or the community members with us. And that allows them to connect to that water body and really help protect, want to protect that water body because that's their platypus there. So, uh, you know, we get some names, like lots of people name them after their creeks. We have Fitz, uh, who was in the first slide from Fitzgerald Creek and Bluey from uh, Blue Gum Creek. Uh, we have some that name them after their children, but some are really special. Uh, we had a gentleman who was with us, uh, we're on his property down in Barrel, and his father had recently passed away. So he named the platypus after his father, and his daughter was there. It was a really sweet moment um, for them. And we just know that having that connection really helps people connect and want to protect the platypus and in turn protect the waterways. And that's what all of our research is about. The platypus we find in Western Sydney are quite small. Uh, we just had a quick conversation about we generally think platypus are these big uh, beaver-like creatures, uh, but they're quite small. So uh, Tom here and the puggles that emerge are around 30 centimetres, so just over a foot. Our platypus that we've captured are uh, 31 centimetres up to about 53 centimetres is our biggest. They weigh about 500 grams to about 1.6 kilos. So again, quite small and much smaller than people often think they are. They have a really range of weird, unique features and I'm going to go through some of them. A venomous spur. Male platypus are extremely dangerous. They have a venomous spur on their hind legs. Now that spur is used for male-to-male -male combat. So it helps them fight off other males during mating season. Uh, but for us, the spur is apparently the most painful thing you can experience. Uh, people get spurred when they pick up platypus. They don't expect it. Um, and they get really spurred uh, on their hands mainly. Now, there's no uh, morphine. Anything like that does not alleviate the pain. Uh, we've heard of stories where a woman gave birth to twins and said she would rather give birth to her twins again than get spurred again. At the start of last year, there was a woman in Tasmania who got spurred and she was in hospital for five days in immense pain. So it's really important that platypuses are handled carefully and that we're respectful um, of them. They're made for swimming. So they have these really cool front feet that you can see here that have an enormous webbing. You'll see some videos throughout my slides and those videos will show you how they use their front feet as really powerful tools to move through the water. On land, they're not so graceful. I'm going to show you a video of Tom here uh, walking on land. You'll see that he bends his webbing back and walks. It looks like he's walking on knuckles and it's quite comical. Platypus are in the water for about 14 hours a day. They have to forage in the water. And on land, they're really just in their burrows. It's really unusual for us to see a platypus out walking around, especially here in Western Sydney. Another really obscure, weird thing platypus do is this photofluorescence. During COVID, people were walking around the British Museum with UV torches. And they found that the platypus are emitting uh, UV light back at them. So we've tested this when we're out in the field. And it's not um, biofluorescence or bioluminescence. It is actually a photo. So the light we put back on them, it gets reflected back on us. Why? Who knows? Platypus are weird. People are researching now why they're doing it. And we'll have the answer shortly. Uh, but there's a number of Australian species that do it. So it's a really a unique feature. And all of our wild platypus um, have done it in a kind of mottled pattern. Platypus eat water bugs. Another really weird feature of platypus is that they have electric receptors in their bill. It's extremely sensitive. These water bugs are under the microscope here, but they're tiny. 
And the platypus forage up to 14 hours a night and they have to eat up to about half their body weight, so 500 grams ish um, of food every night. So that's a lot of water bugs. It takes us hours to collect one gram. So it's going to take platypus that whole 14 hours. They use that bill to find the food. So these prey live in uh, around rock cobbles, under logs, and the platypus use those electric receptors to pick up the electric signals that these bugs set off. And they go, they forage them, they dive down. Platypus are completely blind in the water. They use those receptors to find their food. They put them in their cheek pouches. How cool is that? They have little cheek pouches. They store all their food and they come up. They then put the food uh, into these grinding pads, which you can see in their mouth here. Grind the bugs, swallow it. It's a really amazing feature of platypus. Platypus in Western Sydney are under great threat. These photos are all mainly from Western Sydney, except the top photo here. The top photo is showing us a platypus with an elastic band or a hairband around its neck. Really huge problem for platypus. They can't get those bands off them and they will um, burrow into their uh, skin and burp uh, and can cause strangulation and death for the platypus. We have these two photos uh, of the litter are from Western Sydney. We have a huge amount of litter in Western Sydney and it's a huge problem. We work a lot with councils and different groups to do education programs, little removal programs to help protect those platypus populations. The platypus uh, in the net down there has unfortunately drowned uh, in a opera house trap. This was at Penrith Weir, so very close to here, just up the river from where we are right now. Yabby traps are death sentences for platypus. Closed top yabby traps stop platypus coming up to breathe air. Like us, platypus need to breathe air and they can only be underwater three or four minutes. So they need to constantly come up. With closed top yabby traps, they're designed to trap yabbies in them. Now, unfortunately, when they do that, the yabbies send off heaps of electrical signals. So the platypus think they're coming up to a fast food restaurant. They think they're driving past McDonald's. They'll scoot in there and try and eat all the uh, everything they can. But unfortunately, the way they're designed, they can't get out of the traps and they end up drowning really quickly. There's been huge amounts of deaths of platypus in these traps. We've been collecting deceased platypus um, for the last two or three years now, and I think we've got eight or nine that have drowned in these traps out of the only, we've got 15. So it's a really huge percentage uh, drown in these traps regularly. Discarded fishing line is also a huge problem. So sometimes fishing line is left on the bank Intentionally, people just can't be bothered picking it up. But also, uh, sometimes fishermen get hooked and they'll just cut their line and leave the line dangling. And that actually causes a really huge problem for platypus. They can't see the line. They get tangled in it. They can't get out. They can either drown or receive horrific injuries. It's a really huge problem. We recently wrote a conversation article. My colleague, um, Associate Professor Dr. Rant and Kat, we wrote an article on yabby traps uh, in the conversation last week because it's Clean Up Australia Day, so it was a really good time uh, to get that message out. The platypus in the bottom photo um, was something we don't really see much here. Uh, it was killed by a dog attack. So it came up. Coincidentally, I realised after the stream that the photo above it is Peachtree Creek in Penrith. It came up Peachtree Creek uh, and someone's dog got it. Um, and it's really, uh, you know, we don't see many dog attacks um, of platypus. Platypus are really elusive uh, and really come out at night. And most people, uh, dogs aren't there or, uh, you know, dogs don't really get platypus too much. So it was a really surprising um, that this platypus died through a dog attack. Um, but it happens. Throughout Western Sydney, we receive a lot of treated sewage F1. And why... This graph in the middle here shows that we've had improvements, huge improvements in sewage treatment over the last 30 years. Uh, we've had huge reductions in nitrates and phosphates that are put in. We unfortunately still get a number of emerging contaminants coming through that system, as well as microplastics. So the photos here you can see under the microscope are of microplastics, so really tiny fibres. Things like microbeads, which are in our face scrubs, 
uh, fibers that are in our clothes go through the washing line, go down our sink and end up at the sewage treatment plant. They're not removed at that stage and they end up in our freshwater systems. We have a number of sewage treatment plants that discharge into the Lotz, Brinna, and River. I think Ian can probably give me that number. It's around 30, is it? Or... Yeah, so there's around 30 sewage treatment plants that discharge into the Lotz, Brinna, and River. A huge amount uh, goes in there. So it can really have a huge impact. We have a lot of microplastics. Our um, research with the Hawks Green Japan Waterkeepers has shown in sediment, we have about three, that's four pieces of microplastics per three grams of sediment. So that's really small. It's a teaspoon. So if you think of a teaspoon of sugar, that has four pieces of microplastic in it. Now, all of that can end up in the platypus. And we know when microplastics get into animals, it can line its stomach, make the platypus, make the animals feel full, uh, and they can starve to death. So it's a really big emerging problem that's coming out. And also want to acknowledge that we have mining in our catchment um, and mining discharge, which can also cause water pollution issues, especially with heavy metals. Flooding and drying is a natural cycle that happens in Australia, and platypus have evolved with that. However, with climate change, we see an increase and a more severity of these. Uh, and that can really impact the platypus. These are two local areas up here. So the top is Windsor and the bottom is a creek at Orchard Hills that has already dried out um, at the moment. So there's no water, there's no platypus. And if there's too much water, uh, it can potentially cause a problem for platypus, especially the puggles who aren't used to the waterways, don't know where burrows are. Um, don't know the system well. Often flooding impacts puggles. Adult platypus seem to do pretty well from all the research that's shown. And many people report to us that they see platypus swimming around in their paddock in those backwaters of the floods, uh, really exploiting all those water bugs, all those bugs that are uh, newly formed there. Another huge problem we see is erosion. So when we have uh, water going through a channel, uh, the channel's not protected and lots of the sand uh, sediment and soil gets taken into the waterway it can cause huge problems. So there's three photos on the slide here of that. And then the middle photo down the bottom is of what it results in. And that creek was a creek we sampled in, was between my thigh and my knee in depth. We went to set our traps there last year and we turned up and it looked like that. A huge sand deposit, no longer habitat for platypus. We have a wall of development in Western Sydney. Everywhere you go, no matter how you got to campus today, or the, for those of you online, if you drive around Western Sydney, we have a huge amount of development going on. We have a new airport going in. We have housing estates everywhere in every direction. And with that comes a lot of new infrastructure. We often see uh, around our areas huge amounts of development, and this is one of our uh, sites here, you can see there's two bulldozers, metres from the creek, clearing the land ready for development. Huge amount of stormwater infrastructure going in. So you can imagine the size of that pipe is about uh, just under, it's 1.5 metres, so just under my height. And the amount of water that is about to hit that tiny creek behind it is astounding. You can imagine the size. They're putting that huge stormwater infrastructure in. There's a huge amount of development coming in after it. All of that has a really huge impact on platypus. This is an example of development. Now, this is Box Hill, uh, just here in Western Sydney, uh, down the road about 20 minutes from us. I grew up around there. Um, for those local to the area, the road running up here is Boundary Road. So you can see that over 13 years, there is a huge amount of development going in. 33,000 new houses are planned for that area. It's a really scary thought about how many uh, new people are moving here, which is great. I'm not anti-development. I live in a new estate. Uh, but what we really need to know and acknowledge is that we have platypus and we can work together to help protect platypus to make sure we have them in urbanised Western Sydney. One group who was really concerned about platypus and really where my story starts is with Cat Eye Hills Environment Network and we have uh, Cat Eye here today, um, was a really important area. We were seeing this growth that were in this Box Hill area and this is what it looks like, uh, just a sea of house roofs. 
they were getting reports from people to say, we've got platypus, no one's caring about the platypus, we have, uh, you know, no one's doing anything, we're seeing our water getting filled up with sediment, it's very dirty, we're really worried. Looking at the records, there were two platypus records in this area. Uh, it's circled, the third one is on the other side of the river at Wilberforce. Two platypus records, one from the 90s, uh, one from 98 and one from the 80s. So there was really no scientific acknowledgement that there were platypus in the area. However, they were constantly getting reports of platypus from locals. They're in this northwest growth priority area. They got some funding from Julian Lesser, the federal MP, to do a round of eDNA sampling. They did a round of eDNA sampling. We did 18 sites. Oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. We got a number of community members uh, out with us. So people from the Environment Centre, people from uh, their local area uh, came out uh, and did eDNA. So eDNA is environmental DNA. So uh, we know from those CSI shows, when we walk through somewhere, when we scratch ourselves, we're constantly shedding our DNA and there's traces of us that can be found everywhere. Similarly with the platypus, when they go through the water, when they scratch themselves, when they urinate, when they defecate, they're leaving traces of themselves and DNA behind. Now, technology is now developed that we can take a simple water sample send it to a lab and look for platypus DNA in that sample. It's a really great way of telling if platypus are there. Not great to tell us if they're not there, but a really great way if they found there that we can be assured that there are platypus in that waterway. So we did that with local community members. We did two rounds. So the first round we did 18 samples. We had nine sites come back positive, which is really exciting. We then got some... Um, collaboration with Sydney Water and we did 36 sites in the next round the next year in June 2021 and we ended up with 18 positive sites. So all up uh, out of that eDNA research, we ended up with 20 new sites that we know platypus are in the Cat Eye Creek catchment. So Cat Eye Creek runs from Castle Hill out to the Hawkesbury at Cat Eye. So it's a really exciting thing. And really projected our Hawkesbury and the PM Platypus project. We then started doing eDNA all up and down the Hawkesbury and the PM catchment. We then uh, spent a very long time getting trained up, uh, learning all our methods. And from last year, we started going out and actually looking for platypus. Who is there? What health they're in? What condition they're in? Uh, and where are they found? So this is... Uh, my team and I out, and this is one of the types of nets we use. We use bike nets. Uh, these nets are obviously specialist nets. Uh, you need to have a license to get them uh, and have the proper training. Uh, they're set in shallow waterways, so usually anything under a metre we set bike nets in. And the platypus uh, swim up into them. There's two wings that go either side. Uh, platypus swim into the ring, and we hope uh, that they then scoot into our net other than turn around and go back, which they can do. Uh, once they go through the ring, you'll see here this platypus um, was just in the front chamber, which he can get out of. Once they swim into the second chamber, uh, which is where they usually, they always go, it's very unusual he was in that first chamber, uh, swim into the second chamber, they get trapped in there. So we check the net every couple of hours, depending on the water temperature. And uh, we hope we see a platypus when we pull them up. So here's show you how the funnel systems work. So he goes through the funnel there, and then he's trapped in that back chamber. Now that net goes all the way down to the bottom, so he's got the full water column to go up and down, uh, and we go and retrieve him. It's a very long process. Uh, we start, you know, for example, we leave. We're leaving at three tonight. Today, and we'll probably get back about eight nine o'clock tomorrow morning. So we set the nets in the evening, uh, we check them throughout the night, and then uh, we take them out at sunrise. So really a huge effort uh, to find the platypus. Our preferred method, um, because it's only six hours the nets out for, and we usually get home by about 3 a.m., is mesh nets, which we can use in deeper waterways. Uh, and you might think we don't have many deep creeks around here, but the photo... Um, on the left, for you guys, is uh, us 
in, Cad- in Kellyville. So we're in the middle of Kellyville there in Caddy's Creek. Uh, so we have areas uh, that we can use these nets up here in Western Sydney or in urban Western Sydney. Uh, these nets are mesh nets and, again, specialist nets that you need licences for. Uh, the platypus swim into the net, uh, they get trapped and they come straight up to surface. Uh, they splash and we scoot out very quickly on our boat uh, and get them out of the net. And this is a video of cat doing that. We then pop them in a pillowcase, put them in a safe crate, and then bring them in to be processed. So why uh, cat does pulls the platypus out, she does a quick check. Uh, we treat every platypus as male until two of us have confirmed that there's no spurs. Spurs are very easy to see, um, but we always make sure that uh, we're very uh, confident that there is no spurs. Uh, so Kat will do a quick check as she puts it in the pillowcase uh, if there's spurs or not. Uh, we then transfer them to a dry pillowcase. So part of the, our health check for our ethics is to make sure that the platypus are healthy and that is that they dry out. So platypus should dry out within a few minutes. Um, so we transfer them into a dry pillowcase while we process them to make sure that they do dry out completely. This is a video of Lily um, getting dried out. Now, uh, I said our landholders name them. We, when we don't have landholders, we name them. And uh, my postgraduate students are very into Harry Potter. So we have many Harry Potter names and Lily is one of them. Uh, they let me name a platypus once and I named him Steve and they told me I'm not allowed to name them anymore. So uh, <laughs> we're still on Harry Potter names. So this is Lily uh, getting transferred into a dry pillowcase. And it looks like we're robbing a bank because it was freezing. This was the coldest night we had. We had started having ice forming on us um, on the side of the Bargo River here by about 7.30 in the middle of July. It was very cold. So very sweet. So we then... Uh, Work on them in the pillowcase. That's really the only time we get to see them. Um, we'll do a quick check of spurs. We'll check the spur layer, measure spurs, um, check for entanglements. But Lily was female and had no entanglements, so that's why that was super quick. We then work on them in the pillowcase. So we check to see if they're microchipped. Uh, we actually catch... Uh, Lily's the only one we've captured twice, um, but we always check to make sure they're not microchipped. Uh, if they're not, we microchip them so we can identify them. We then do all their measurements and weights um and take a fur sample and then we pop them back in the creek which is the best bit so we have them for about 15 20 minutes and then we release them That's Steve. <laughs> it's our Penrith platypus. And that's Pad for our biggest. So he looks chunky. He was chunky. Wow. Oh, about 1.6 kilos. Harry? And Bluey. This is Draco. So we had really great results. We've added 65 new known locations of platypus to the scientific database of platypus in Western Sydney and Greater Sydney, which is a really exciting thing. Platypus weren't recognised as being here. There was very little work done on them. A lot of the work done by Dr. Tom Grant was done in the 90s, um, early 2000s, and uh, really not up in this area. So it's really exciting that we've been able to contribute that. We've found that platypus really need five things that are essential for platypus in Western Sydney particularly. One is tall trees. 
So I'm going to talk about the riparian zone. And the riparian zone is the area uh, alongside the creek where we have vegetation. What we want in that riparian zone is tall trees greater than five metres. Now, this is really important for a few reasons. One, the roots of the trees help hold the bank together. And that a stable bank means platypus can safely burrow into it. It provides those roots, provide habitat for water bugs, which platypus need. And it also provides shade. We hear constantly about uh, urban heat in Western Sydney and the amount of uh, heat islands we have. And we have that in our urban areas, in Kellyville, in Penrith, where we're finding platypus. These tall trees help keep the creek cooler. It's really important for them. The second thing is a wide riparian zone. So we want as wide from the river edge to the paddock or to the properties as we can, all of vegetation. We want to see uh, at least three metres is our magical number, it seems to be, in Western Sydney. If we don't have at least three metres, we're finding less platypus in that area. We really want organic matter and wooden debris in creeks. So lots of people think that they need to start removing fallen trees, from creeks, but no, they're really important for platypus. They provide heaps of habitat for our water bugs. There'll be so many water bugs around this tree that's fallen in the creek there. So we want to leave it in there. It's really important. It also helps the platypus triangulate where bugs are. You will often see them foraging around rocks, around trees, somewhere where they can hone in on those electrical signals. Really important. We want to see overhanging vegetation and vegetation along the whole creek. The overhanging vegetation, again, provides habitat for water bugs, but it provides protection for particles burrows. You probably won't see a burrow unless you're in the creek at the water level. You might have to move a bit of veg and you'll see particles burrows underneath. Particles want to protect their burrows. That's where they're most vulnerable, things like foxes, cats. So having it with overhanging vegetation is really important and having a lot of vegetation, a variety. So we don't just want grass, we don't just want trees. Uh, we want a lot of thick vegetation. And the fifth thing is a lack of sedimentation, silt and sand slugs. And this is a photo of a sand slug at Cat Eye just after that development that I showed you uh, the moving image of over 13 years. These sand slugs provide no habitat for platypus. All they reduce it, so all they do is reduce the amount of water available for them, the amount of foraging habitat. They smother the rocks, logs that platypus use uh, to find food. They also reduce the size of pools. So when we start seeing drying in creeks, uh, we start to see areas that are deeper. Uh, platypus congregate there. Uh, that becomes really important to have habitat for platypus. And this is a pool that's just half its size um, because of a sand slug from development. And it's really hard when we're in Western Sydney and we're seeing this development happening. Um, an example here is this is us on South Creek uh, and this is the new M12 going in next to us here. And you can see uh, the footing of the M12 right on the edge of South Creek. When we went to sample South Creek, uh, the people before us, they did a fish survey. It was really deep. Uh, you find, your nets are fine to go out. We went out and there is over a metre of loose sediment sitting in that creek. That creek is about a metre deep. There's so much sediment sitting there and that's at the halfway through South Creek. Uh, anyone who drives over South Creek, if you could drive over South Creek home, have a look at how chocolate that looks at the moment. Dr. Ian Wright shows photos of South Creek and the plume of sediment that comes out of South Creek into the Hawkesbury River, and it's from development like this. The amount of stormwater pipes that are going in uh, really can have a huge impact, and there's lots of things we can do. We are really fortunate that councils and developers want to work with us to 
help protect the platypus that we have there. So simple things like if this stormwater pipe wasn't going directly into the creek, but ran through a series of wetlands or even 100 metres of wetlands, they would have a huge amount of nutrient removal, sediment removal uh, and metal removal. So things like that, the easy things that developers can do early in the stage, um, we found developers are really receptive to and we've been really happy with the results that we've had from working with developers. Concerned about the impact that things like concrete have on our platypus, we've started looking at the impacts of metals on platypus. So what happens? We know that metals get into our waterway. We know they get into plants, but then do we know if they get into platypus or not? So we've been working, looking at that. And this is some work um, from Maddie's thesis on looking at different sites around Western Sydney and the levels of metals in platypus fur. So we take a fur sample, very easy to take, doesn't hurt the platypus at all. And we can look at heavy metals in it. Now, when I say reference, we have no reference creeks in Western Sydney. We defined reference um, or non-urban as anything where the catchment is less than 30% concrete. Uh, so we had four of those that we could find easily in Western Sydney. Urban catchments, we considered anything above 60% of concrete in the catchment as urban. So that's how we characterised that. Now you can see that urbanisation is having an impact on the metal loads in platypus. Uh, really concerning barium, uh, strontium and zinc are all higher in our urban platypus than in the platypus that live in those less urbanised areas. A really concerning level is mercury. So we were having mercury um, found in our platypus. We don't find it in the water. We don't find it in the sediment, um, but we found it in our urban bugs and we found it in our urban platypus. So further research, you know, if anyone's interested in a PhD, I'm around for the next 20 years and I am keen to explore the millions of questions we have that we're uncovering. Um, so, yeah, so really interesting that we know that this is all having an impact on our platypus. It's really a huge part of my role and I feel like it's probably the most important part of my role is to do really good science and then share it with everyone and not just our undergraduate students here at Western who I'm sure get sick of me talking about platypus, but with the community and our future students who are here today. Um, we work a lot with industry groups, government organisations and local community groups to get the word out about platypus and the really easy things we can do to help protect it. We work with a lot of councils on really repairing that riparian zone, so planting plants along creek beds, putting in wetlands, maintaining wetlands, and there's some of the photos here. We do a talk about platypus before it, and then, uh, and then the community goes off and plants. I think to date our group has planted over more than 5,000 plants in Western Sydney over the last two years, which is really exciting. A huge part of our role as well is communicating. So getting our message out to the wider public, and we talked about the conversation article Ian Cat and I did. Uh, we do lots and lots of media. We're happy to share our stories and share our videos. So we've been on ABC News, ABC Radio, TV, uh, and in a lot of local papers, really telling people, like, how amazing is it that you can go down the creek in Penrith and see a platypus? You can go to Fred Catterson Reserve at Castle Hill and see a platypus. It's amazing, and it's really important that we connect people with their waterways through using the platypus. This slide is to acknowledge everyone who's worked with us, who's collaborated with us and who uh, has funded our study. So we thank everyone so much for that. And that is the end of my talk with an unnamed platypus. I shouldn't, this one doesn't have a name. So he's a Cat Eye Creek platypus. Uh, someone had asked me to, um, where they can go to photograph a platypus. So this platypus comes out every day for about three seconds until he sees someone and disappears. Uh, so they got this photo. Uh, and one more and then disappeared. They went back the next day in a ghillie suit, which is like a, they completely cover themselves uh, and look like a bush. And they just sit there with their camera uh, and they reckon they could see that the platypus spotted them and went straight away. So um, this one is very elusive. 
uh, doesn't like humans, but we've got this amazing photo. Uh, so I love ending on this one. So thank you all so much for having me. And I think we have questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, there is one question from Adriana. There, there are two questions, actually. First question is, um, where do platypus go when a creek is dry? Yeah, so we'll start to see the platypus have evolved, Australian native species that have evolved with drying. So they start getting those environmental cues uh, that a creek's drying and they will move into more permanent sources of water. So they will move usually into the closest river. So if you think of a, a creek near you, um, that will connect to a larger river. So the Hawkesbury River, the Nepean River, Bargo, um, they will move into that system. Uh, some will move into uh, huge dams. So some farmers, you know, have huge amounts of water storage. Uh, Platypus will move into there if that's nearby. Um, but that's generally what we see is them moving into rivers. And sometimes they get trapped. And uh, in the 2019, uh, the team from UNSW had to go and remove some from a drying waterway. Uh, and it was they were kept at Taronga, fed up, uh, and then put back when the water came back. So... Um, Platypus really can struggle uh, in times of drought. A follow-up question from Adriana. How come those developments, what you are explaining, don't have adequate sediment and erosion controls? Can they be called out and stop impact? Yeah, that's an absolutely, that's an excellent question. And as part of uh, development anywhere, you have to have uh, sedimentation controls and erosion controls put in. If you drive around any development site, you will see examples of no sediment control and very poor sediment control. It really needs to be enforced. And local councils do have enforcers and they do go out and do it. But we have such a huge amount of development that it's everything cannot be enforced all of the time. It's just a lack of personnel. Um, we, as the general public, you can report it. So there's a Snap, Send, Solve app on your phone. And as you walk around, uh, if you're walking around your um, development or your town and you see something, you can just quickly take a photo and upload it. And that get, gives it to the local council with GBS coordinates, all the information they need, and they can go out and do it. And we've done that a number of times. Um, but it's really a lack of enforcement. Uh, Tamil uh, says... Amazing work, Michelle and team. Will you be looking at pharmaceuticals contaminants like Richmond et al. 2018? Like what, sorry? Pharmaceutical contaminants. Yep. And with uh, quoting some of the article, I think, like Richmond et al. 2018. So, name, uh, I'll ask that question. What's the name of the article? Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, so potentially in uh, Sir Truman, there are pharmaceuticals. Um, that are discharged, not taken out at treatment. Some are, some aren't. Um, so, yeah, there's potential to look at those pharmaceuticals in platypus um, in our area. It would be really interesting to look at. There is one more question, then we can go to the people Thanks. here. Uh, is there any research or data from the declared catchment areas? It's from Philip. Um, Warangmata or Upper Napier. Warangaba Gamba or Upper Napier, etc. Yeah, so we haven't been into the special areas yet. We're uh, in the process of uh, getting into uh, the special areas, but uh, we haven't got any data from there because we haven't been in there now. I believe there was a few studies done just outside of the special areas, but we um, currently have no data in there. I know that they see them in there. We've had other researchers who uh, did research a number of years ago uh, and would see platypus all the time in there. So well, we know they're in there, but no, we currently have no data on that. Hopefully in a year or two I can report back on that. Yep. Yeah, great question. So there's a question about uh, fishing line and other campaigns to help uh, reduce that. So we currently work with Hawkesbury City Council on a fishing line bin project. So we've got bins that are out uh, in different spots along the Hawkesbury River uh, and we've been measuring for the past 
three years fishing line uh, that have been put in the bin and have been left on the bank. We've seen a huge reduction of fishing line that have been left on the bank. Uh, in the three years from the three fights, we've collected just over 2.5 kilometres of fishing line that have been responsibly placed in the bin. So that's really exciting because before that, our data was terrible and we're getting lots of fishing line left on the bank. So uh, that's a really great initiative. And lots of councils, I believe Campbelltown Council, have put in fishing line bins as well. Uh, we see them in estuary systems to remind people, but really freshwater systems are always left out. So it's really good that councils are now starting to recognise that. Uh, Wall and Dilly do a really good signage campaign about leaving fishing line and opera house traps. Um, Ozfish are doing a really great uh, swap for um, opera house traps at the moment. So if you send in your opera house trap or drop them at a trap drop-off site, which, uh, you know, we were when we did the Clean Up Australia Day event uh, last weekend, you get a fishing lure. So you can drop off your, I call them death traps, and we will still get a free fishing lure. So if you go to the Ozfish website, um, they have all the information there where you can send your trap in uh, and get that fishing lure, which is really great. So there are a number of initiatives going on to try and reduce that and create awareness. Some people don't even think about it. They're, you know, focused on their thing. They don't even know there's platypus in their waterway. So, you know, many people are devastated if it happens. So really just try to get the message out there that there's platypus and there's easy things we can do, like not use opera house traps to prevent them. Yes. Yeah, excellent question. So there was a question about the estimated population. So we have only just started our journey trying to find out. So we know uh, where they are, but the eDNA can only tell us presence, absence. It can't tell us how many. So our trapping will do that. The microchips, we look at numbers of recaptures. There's, you know, methods for us to work out population size, but we haven't done enough work yet. So we've been out, I think it was 42 nights last year. Still not enough data to do sort of any sort of estimation. Up here in this area of the Hawkesbury and Apian, it's a very low density population. So we can go, I think we the most we went was six nights without capturing a platypus. So um, it's very low density and it's something that over the years we'll be able to kind of work out an estimate of population size. So it's, I guess it puts more pressure on us to try and protect them now um, before we lose them all. Uh, there's a question at the back. It's an excellent question that I cannot answer. I don't know. The response. So we had a, sorry for everyone on Zoom, a question about the UV reflection um, and the hair type and is that why? Um, and I can't answer. I don't know. I know they reflect it, but it's I've never delved into why they do it. And I know there's some brilliant people working on it. Um, and I can share with your teachers when that article comes out on why they do it, but I don't, I can't answer that for you. I'm sorry. It's an excellent question. I really like your line of thinking. It's great. Yes, Peter. How many academics in Australia would be researching platypus? Yeah, so uh, platypus are really under-researched because, sorry, someone asked how many academics research platypus. Uh, they're a really elusive species. It's hard to, you know, it's many nights, very labour intensive. Um, it's also a difficult species to capture. So there's a few, there's Arsen UNSW in Sydney, in uh, New South Wales. Uh, I think there's the Particles Conservancy and uh, a few ecologists in Victoria, um, a couple in Tasmania. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, lady in Queensland who does it, who's just finished her PhD and she's building up a team um, up there. So there's a number of people up there under her that are starting to work on platypus. Uh, and in South Australia, uh, they're looking at reintroducing the platypus. Um, so there's a team working on that. Um, and I don't want to say the name of the university because I might get it wrong. So I apologise to those researchers. And there's a team of researchers there who also look at the Kangaroo Island population. So, you know, there's less than 10 probably groups that 
um, research platypus. And that's that's a huge, to the detriment of platypus. So uh, platypus in New South Wales are listed as threatened and nationally are not listed as threatened because of a lack of baseline data. So it's hard to make the case um, that we're losing platypus when there's really no data. And as we can see in Western Sydney, there's been really no data. So it's a huge unfortunately, to the detriment of platypus. Yes. What's the next step? Yeah, excellent question. So the next steps for us um, is continuing this work. You know, every time uh, we get more data or look at, you know, a student works on a project, we just end up with, you know, 10 more questions. So I'm really guided by what my students' interests are. So uh, Bree, who's just started, is really interested in the genetic connectivity of the platypus and how the different populations up and down the Hawksbrin of PN catchment are related to each other uh, and also the movement. So really understanding how they use this whole system. Um, so that's, you know, her focus. Uh, others are interested in climate change um, or those kind of factors, water pollution, metal pollution. So it's really, uh, you know, help guided by the students. I really, I feel like I kind of hold the umbrella and you know, as long as we're collecting data and building that evidence base on platypus um, and the health in Western Sydney is kind of my general focus. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, excellent question. So, um, uh, a question about databases. So the Atlas of Living Australia is a really good one. Um, and people from all over Australia can uh, put in their data there. There's a number of apps that you can put in. So there's a Platypus Spot app uh, that's on your phone that you can upload data there. Uh, you can report sightings to the Australian Platypus Conservancy and they um, put in the data on their database, which you shared. And also ACF, um, Australian Conservation Foundation, have done a database. You can go online and it looks at, it pulls from all the databases and tells you, uh, you know, re recent records or historical records. So there are a number of available databases. For um, us and for developers, really the important database is Bionet, which is the scientific records. Uh, as part of our licensing conditions, we need to upload all the, our data to that. And that's what uh, developers and councils use. So um, it's really important when you have a sighting that you do report it. Right, yes. You mentioned, um, and good on you, that there were like six nights in a row where you didn't yes. do anything. Um, or did you catch, did you catch anything else? Yeah, excellent question. Yeah, a really great question. So it's about other things we catch in the net. So. The nets we use are actually eel catching nets. Um, so we often capture eels uh, and it's really, you know, as much as uh, we don't, you know, that's not our focus, it's exciting when we catch other things. So for example, uh, just I personally have learned that we have bull routes in the uh, freshwater section up here, which is uh, the st freshwater stonefish. I didn't even think about them being in uh, all the way up in our creeks in urban areas. Um, really dangerous uh, but we got those in our nets and I was like oh my like so that was really you know that was exciting to find those we get lots of mullet uh, lots of bass and so that's really exciting to see these huge mullet in the uh, South Creek especially it just seems to be full of mullet and big pregnant girls uh, so we were really excited and it tells us that there is a healthy ecosystem there uh, that there's enough food to sustain these really big fish populations so it's really, uh, that's really great to see. Um, I think that's pretty much fish and eels. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned um, in Canada, like you say, about the bands around the neck. Yeah. Um, being quiet, things like that. Is there something that people can do that might reduce this? Yeah, excellent question. So reducing hair tie and uh, elastic band entanglement. Um, so really the best thing you can do, um, and there's a huge campaign, on at the moment for SNP rings for wildlife. So anything that is can be a ring that can get entangled in a platypus or a bird uh, is just to cut it before you put it in the bin. 
is really important, then it can't uh, get around. We do lots of education, especially with schools, around hair bands. So lots of schools back onto creeps. Uh, and it's really important that we tell people, like, if you see a hair band, just pick it up, put it in your pocket, chuck it in the bin when you get home, uh, snip it and put it in your bin. So it's really just about thinking uh, not to leave hair bands. And, you know, uh, sporting fields are notorious for hair bands being littered everywhere. So it's really about thinking about that. A lot of questions in chat. A um, lot of appreciation and thank you for the great work. And one question from Liz. Thinking about bit better fishing practices, does fisheries have data on who is fishing along the Hawkesbury Napier and insights on how to target this segment? Yeah, that is uh, an excellent question, and I'm sure uh, they would have that data. Um, if anyone from fisheries is online and wants to put that in the chat, that would be great. Um, but you know, we have to have fishing licences, and I know we get as I hold a fishing license. I get sent out surveys, so they do collect that data. And doing targeted approach would be really important. Before we did the fishing line bins, we did our own surveys looking at what we call fishing hotspots in the Hawkesbury Nepean as to where should we put our fishing line bins in the first place. So surveys do happen, and I'm, I'm not sure if fisheries hold the data. I'm sure that there is um, some data on that. There is a uh, question from Jess. How can I get involved as a community member in restoring habitat for collecting data? Excellent. That's such a great question. Uh, thank you, Jess, for that. So there's a number of groups you can join. One really great group that collects water quality data throughout Sydney is Streamwatch. So you can go on uh, Greater Sydney Landcare site, have a look at Streamwatch. There's a number of groups up and down in these freshwater systems that you can join to help to collect data help protect the waterways and if there's not a streamwatch group a uh, streamwatch coordinator will help you develop a group in your area which is really exciting a number of bush care and land care groups also do a lot of work on riverbed riverbank so it's really you can contact your local council um, or land care and they will point you in the right direction of a group near you uh, thank you all for our thank you guys so much i really appreciate your being here, sir.